Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a TIP webinar entitled Strategic Partnership for a Secure and Digital Europe. And thank you so much for joining us today. And we apologize for a couple of minutes uh, of delay, but thank you for bearing with us. And I hope that you're able to join us now. Um, so given the changing geopolitical global picture and challenging security situation we're facing in Europe, and at a time when we actually are witnessing a digital space becoming a new ground for strategic competition, We've organized this very important and timely discussion today, and we're also launching a publication on these two important issues, how to forge a digitally advanced future, which we believe holds great potential for development of our economies, and secondly, how to deepen transatlantic cooperation, as we're realizing that it's based on shared values which are no longer to be taken for granted. Um, we're very honored that we have two prominent leaders joining us today, Her Excellency Tanya Fayon, Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Slovenia, and Her Excellency Kersti Kerilajt, former president of Estonia. We will start in the first part with a fireside chat, albeit online. Uh, but as mentioned today, as we're also launching a new publication on the same topic, uh, which SIP has prepared with a number of partners, we will continue our discussion with two of the contributors uh, to the publication who will be joining us in the second part uh, to address these topics and to reflect upon um, what our ladies will tell us in the, in the first part. This is Ms. Evelina Kaspchik, a researcher and chief editor of the European Cybersecurity Journal at Kosciuszko Institute, and Mr. Gregor Stroin, vice chair of the Committee on AI at the Council of Europe. I would kindly invite the audience to share their thoughts and questions on the chat so we can actively participate in this manner. And now, without further ado, um, let's turn to the topics and to our distinguished speakers. Um, First question will be for Minister uh, Fayon, particularly. We're actually, I'll be, I'll be honest, I'm sitting in Prague right now. <laughs> so even though Slo TIP is a Slovenian organization and I should be next door to you, uh, Madam Minister, but uh, I'm currently in Prague and at, a, at another event that's happening uh, discussing a transatlantic partnership. And I think uh, at this event, we've actually heard said that uh, the war in Ukraine was kind of a wake up call. Uh, about the importance of values and the fact that security is not to be taken for granted um, anymore. So how would you characterize the importance of transatlantic partnership in this digital age? And what in, in your view are the main features of the transatlantic partnership in the digital sphere? Thank you very much. Let me first uh, warmly welcome you, everyone participating at today's event from the building of our foreign ministry in Ljubljana. And thank for the opportunity to participate in this important event. Um, it addresses very relevant issues for securing our digital future in cooperation with our closest allies. And as you said at the beginning, I'm extremely proud um, to share today's panels with two female colleagues and, of course, all the others that are with us. Now, I would like to say um, the answer to your question, certainly yes. Um, does the transatlantic partnership still matter in the digital age? Certainly, transatlantic partnership matters, and probably even more than ever before in the recent history. It is the most natural, it is obvious choice for Europe um, in terms of very many shared interest principles and values. Now, it is also very important that we have these close allies, strategic partnerships with all like-minded countries. Um, it's necessary for the present and the future of our digital Europe, not only in terms of upholding our common democratic values, our free societies in our digital tomorrow with a human face, but also in coping with other challenges through this lens. And in a given strategic and um, geopolitical setting, this partnership also fosters the potential to join comparative advantages of both sides of the Atlantic, be it in economic, be it in technological or uh, digital fields. And I can elaborate a few examples. For example, the ties across the Atlantic are deeply rooted. Um, in strong historical, cultural, and interpersonal links. But most important, as I mentioned before, they're based on our shared 
fundamental values that are very much in danger right now. I'm speaking about democracy. I'm speaking about the rule of law. I'm speaking about the protection of human rights. And these are all cornerstones of the rules of base international order. So I here see that we are most uh, natural allies. Uh, we have very strongly interlinked our economies and transatlantic trade is a key alert of global economy. And just give you one um, um, number um, to prove that our economic and trade partnership is strong and resilient. Uh, we have a bilateral trade and investment support, million of jobs in the EU and the US and almost 10 million people are directly employed by the US companies in EU and vice versa. And since the EU and US summit last year, important steps have been taken to advance uh, the transatlantic agenda on a positive and uh, forward looking path. We found pragmatic solutions to very costly ongoing trade disputes and took actions to avoid new ones. I just mention and touch upon um, the Trade and Technology Council that we set up as the central platform to strengthen our cooperation and deliver concrete outcomes. But I will come uh, most probably um, later on to this um, question. Just coming back to the female element of today's uh, discussion, I find very important because I am myself the first female foreign minister in the history of my country, but um, I am proud to introduce also the feminist approach to our diplomacy and foreign policy. Why I'm mentioning that? Because it's important that we bring equal opportunities on all specters of our life. And that goes also when we speak about cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, energy security, food security, peace and stability, and um, we are promoting strongly this um, angle of feminist foreign policy, best practices for achieving gender equality and women's empowerment in all foreign policy aspects. So uh, final data, female internet users already face a higher number of cybercrime incidents and online harassment. And together, these factors underscore the importance of designing a cyberspace that is safer, more gender inclusive, and promotes the efforts to close the gender gap. And this is an important angle also in our transatlantic partnership for our better digital future. Thank you very much. Uh, and I think, uh, thank you very much for pointing this out as well, the gender, um, the gender issue, which we, um, particularly in security um, areas do not address enough. And I think uh, uh, it's very, very important that we discuss this element too. So um, Madam President, let me, um, let me pass it to you uh, on the transatlantic uh, partnership. Um, and if you'd like to address the gender issue, we'd be also very happy to hear your voice in this discussion. Um, but uh, is a glass half empty or glass half full? Uh, there's debates on all sides. We do have challenges. We've had trade disputes with our transatlantic partners, and we had TTIP, which was a very ambitious agenda for our economic um, development of, of the partnership. However, it didn't kind of go so well, and now we're um, fielding uh, Trade and Technology Council as, as the next fora in which to develop our relationship. What do you, what do you believe? How do we take this forward? Well, first and foremost, indeed, congratulations to Slovenia for having taken over the flag for the feminist foreign policy. And I, I welcome this approach very much. And as the global advocate for every woman, every child of Secretary General Antonio Guterres of United Nations, I would also like to point out that uh, everything which uh, is going on in the lives of uh, women and children is also going on online lives of women and children and therefore we need, indeed need to make sure that the bad practices of analog life are not uh, are not actually uh, continuing in the cyberspace and uh, do not that uh, digital opportunities do not facilitate actually uh, actually uh, child trafficking uh, prostitution all other things uh, what we what we are worried about generally in the analog world 
So I do welcome uh, that approach. Now, what concerns digital technologies and, uh, and uh, Trade and Tech Council, TTIP, and maybe I would also like to add the uh, initiative of Free Sea and its Trusted Connectivity concept from Challenge Digital Summit uh, last year. There are many initiatives and um, they are, of course, of, uh, of varied uh, weight. So uh, if I finally, if you asked, I mean, what about TTIP, then I would say that I do hope that through uh, 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 this Tech Council, we would also uh, build more trust to have kind of more comprehensive and, uh, and, uh, and uh, complete uh, trade agreement with our transatlantic partners, because finally, I believe this should be the objective. Technology is in every sector, so it's, it doesn't exist anymore, like tech sector or digital sector. And, and therefore, we need to widen the span of cooperation, absolutely. I believe that uh, particularly this year has made it uh, very clear to everybody that uh, in technology, we must really pay attention to with whom we are actually cooperating. And uh, while everybody now says loud and clear that no tech exchange, of course, with Russia, who is aggressing Ukraine uh, at the moment when we, are, when we are talking. But I still hear people who say, like, for example, with China, well, there is no other opportunity than to work with China because Chinese economy is far too big to ignore it. And I would say that a year ago we heard the same story about uh, not being able to live without Russian, uh, Russian gas and Russian oil. And we now see we very well are able to. So if the free and democratic world sets itself a clear objective that in tech development we cooperate only with free and democratic world in order to avoid that these technologies are used for by autocrats to uh, oppress their own people or break up our societies in the free world, then we can achieve this objective. But in order to achieve this objective, we need to state it very clearly that we want to achieve this objective. And I'm not uh, right now not convinced that we are already there. I think we should continue also through our uh, uh, Trade and Tech Council and all other initiatives which we have to promote uh, the idea of trusted connectivity. I mean, if you talk to people, let's say, from, from Singapore or elsewhere, they very much pay attention to the security of all the cables, for example, the physical infrastructure. And uh, we know what happened to Nord Streams this year, and we know there have been mysterious cutting of cables in, um, in various parts of the world. So this kind of fight against the safe inf infrastructure, even in the physical part, is now global. We can only, I mean, imagine how much the autocratic powers are trying to make sure that we are not feeling safe in our connected world. And I think we need to therefore make absolutely sure that we have some kind of labels, be it blue dot, which was promoted by Australia, US, has been somewhat taken over by Matthias Korman in OECD right now, or be it some other standard, but our users must be able to notice every time they are using some kind of system, I don't know, taking, uh, taking out a plane ticket, for example, or logging into system to pass their car across one border, uh, for example, they must know, they must have a sign which tells them this is part of trusted connectivity infrastructure. Similarly, for example, take railway signaling system. We must make sure it is trusted connectivity infrastructure so that those who might be interested in scaring us by disruption will not be able to get at us. And this is getting more and more important. So for me, indeed, economy finally in the wider sense of the world than just digital and tech economy because every sector is digital and tech but we are obviously driven by security right now and i think it is very good that we are driven by security if we draw the right conclusions then it finally will also facilitate that our economies will be secured by this concept of really uh, working only in the trusted connected environments um Thank you very much. And you pointed out something extremely important. That is how security, uh, digital development and living in a free world, how they are all intrinsically interlinked and dependent on each other. And uh, a very ambitious objective, which I really much agree with, uh, is set uh, in a sense that we should connect the free world and operate within the free world and, and really uh, make sure that we push back on the authoritarian regimes in, in that way. 
uh, to preserve our own and protect our own, so to speak. And I think that's extremely important. Um, Madam Minister, I will come back to you uh, in now pointing the, uh, the question of, is Trade Technology Council the right forum and the, the ambitious enough forum to do that, to promote the free world? Let me first react on the remarks that are very important of Madam President. Um, this is the angle um, of what the world is now experiencing, uh, a digital revolution associated with new types of uh, risks and threats to which all states are exposed, but unequally prepared to respond. Um, Europe has always been, or it's now even more, target of cyber attacks, incidents, um, and recently we are um, facing a strong uh, propaganda, fake news um, by uh, Russian, um, or put it in the context of Russian aggression in Ukraine, or as you said, President, in um, it's being used by autocrats, um, how to avoid it. And this is something we really have to put a strong emphasis on and share the, the best practices and knowledge and the expertise and raise awareness among uh, our um, population and citizens. Now, on the question whether TTC can be a good platform on that, I mean, we know that uh, as often among friends, there are also some challenges that we are ha having, and we continue to face problems such as protectionist and discriminatory elements. But however, I hope that we can find solution as we have uh, proven that we can do that as in the past, resolving past issues on um, clearly the TCC does not have a magic wand. Um, it has been established when transatlantic trade relations were burdened uh, by some long lasting and some new disputes. Um, it covers a comprehensive list of issues from safety of supply chains to climate technology, data governance and human rights. And on both sides, we need some time to be acquainted with the rules, legislation, synergies and divisions. Honestly, I think um, very important steps further have been done in the last year. Um, that being said, as I mentioned before, um, in Slovenia uh, or in European Union, uh, we definitely support uh, the delivery of tangible results and the TTC also has to prove to be a solid basis for our collaboration and help to overcome the irritants in our trade. Um, let me mention in particular that you support the deliverables in how to use digital tools to facilitate our trade, and we need to set the standards so we are not going to like them. But um, in 2021, um, you presented the so no one digital compass and um, the themes to shape Europe's digital future and translate our digital ambitions for the next decade into clear concrete targets. And this digital compass also intends to establish international digital partnerships. And for the EU, the US, as I said, is the most tangible or natural partner in this endeavor. So we'll not only increase our digital cooperation, but also promote digital policy principles globally. Um, just briefly um, on TTC, um, we are particularly pleased that um, uh, the last TTC meeting addressed standards on so-called trustworthy artificial intelligence. As Slovenia and the EU are fierce advocates of trustworthy and human-centered artificial intelligence. And this work will now be taken forward at the next TTC meeting. So it's a real strong emphasis on cybersecurity and that shall serve us as a cornerstone of our digital agenda. I have to unmute myself. <laughs> uh, Madam Minister, can I just actually follow up with a very quick question? There's another TTC meeting coming up in the beginning of December. Um, would you uh, give us an opinion of what should be um, uh, or what do you believe the outcomes will be and what should be uh, strongly pushed at that meeting? I think, as we said before, we live today in an unprecedented um, new situation that we maybe eight, nine months ago um, 
haven't been expecting so our uh, global order our international law um, is seriously in danger also our values that we share with like-minded partners like democracy rule of law also of, of freedom of speech and uh, what we mentioned before new um, aspects of security um, using the digital technologies being used by autocrats or being used as a fake propaganda to manipulate um, citizens and societies, that should be something that we have to strongly address because we live in a new reality world today and these new technologies are an opportunity but also a serious threat to our society. If they are in the wrong hands. And we are seeing that that is happening in front of our eyes and that we are not um, able to respond effectively. Um, Madam President, uh, to pick it up from, uh, from the discussion on the TTC, I would also like to hear your views reflected on what uh, do you believe is going to happen or should happen in the next meeting. But also I was... Um, a slightly provocative question perhaps, but uh, in the EU, and, and I really welcome, uh, as um, Minister Fayon mentioned, the digital compass, the ambitiousness of the EU in this regard. Uh, however, are we over-regulating or digital on, or not? I mean, where do we strike the appropriate balance to make sure that we don't lose advantage vis-a-vis -vis outside actors so that we do have our values represented in the regulation, however, that we're not, um, we're not losing competitive advantage here? Well, what concerns legislation, this is very obvious that we simply need to uh, well follow the suggestions of all, for example, UN working groups or Tallinn manuals from NATO Center of Excellence or Cy on, uh, of Cybersecurity, which everybody basically come to the conclusion that analog legislation applies in the cyberspace. We don't need to create additional new legal space it's the same space and we need to just explain to each other how we plan to apply the analog rules in the digital space. And I would say that the EU legislation, which has been dealing with, let's say, data safety and, uh, and privacy issues, actually is just a nice explanation how we prolong our analog uh, legal space into the digital sphere. And I believe this is the way forward because we do not have two worlds, analog and digital. I mean, we still have only one and we act and transact in both. This is uh, extremely important. What concerns uh, uh, the uh, GTC and what should be on the next agenda, those who are actually putting agenda together can be kind of more, let's say, detailed in their approach. But I have a dream list, actually, and my dream list is with something like that. First and foremost, if we want to have more uh, digital cooperation, which will also function at the grassroots levels, like people safely uh, acting and transacting online, then we should agree with our transatlantic partners how our digital identification tools could work on both sides of Atlantic. We know in Europe we have ADAS. Every European citizen has the right to a digital identity, which should be ADAS compatible digital identity. It's true that even among ourselves, we are not fully making use of these tools at all. But I mean, there are a few examples like um, processing of e-prescriptions through the same system in Finland, Estonia and Portugal, and we have similar examples. So we need to ask our partners how to drive anonymity out of the digital transaction space. Because it is very weird that, I mean, 25 years after internet went mainstream, we still live in internet world without a passport, while in analog world we all have passports and we would not ever buy anything or sell anything to anybody which is bigger than an ice cream without actually making sure that, that they provide, well, some verification, for example, that they are who they are, more or less. So we need to have such kind of a system with our transatlantic partners. So we need to ask whether they would, I mean, accept ADAS as general standard or not. Same applies for privacy rules and regulations. We have set up a, quite a good set of uh, rules in European Union. Actually, many American companies are telling, telling that uh, de facto they are following what Europe has decided because they don't want to have kind of uh, diverging uh, legal space. So we, we must make sure that also in this privacy and security, we do not have diverging legal space, but uh, a common space where we act and transact. 
then we have, uh, I believe, an obligation to make sure that this is not a kind of public sector to public sector initiative, but we bring in our private sector partners to these discussions uh, urgently. Because as we are very much seeing, for example, the same defense industry, in the free and democratic world, technology is nowadays not created in the uh, public hands. It's not like 20th century when internet itself or nuclear weapons, if they were created, I mean, every administration big enough to, I mean, uh, be part of the development naturally knew of them. Nowadays, quite a lot of the development, for example, in AI happens in companies like DeepMind and elsewhere. We have absolutely no uh, control over that. And I believe in general it is a good thing. But we need to make sure now that we onboard these technologies, not only into our defense industry, where I see NATO is actually getting quite good at doing it, but also in, uh, in, in the debates and discussions where we discuss this transatlantic partnership in, uh, in a civilian sector. And finally, there is an urgent matter, which I believe TTC should discuss this time. And this is how to save the reputation of the technology, which is the basis for the cryptocurrencies. We all know what is happening in the crypto world right now. But actually, uh, what is happening with one application of blockchain technology or KSA technology, for example, which is similar but less energy consuming, I mean, that the way it has been used it, and misused uh, does not mean that the technology itself is bad. So we should make sure that we understand what is happening, decouple the cryptocurrency issues from blockchain and technology issues, and make sure that we learn from this experience to make sure that this technology serves us perfectly in the future. Um, thank you very much for highlighting these extremely important issues. Um, we are almost at the end of our time, on the side chat, but I do want to come uh, come back to Minister Fayon and um, uh, get your uh, get your thoughts on the regulation in cyberspace. Uh, if you wanted to add anything, and particularly uh, mention mentioning the multi stakeholder approach in cybersecurity, which I think is important. So bringing in the private sector as well, as Madam President mentioned. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, when we were discussing about what should be uh, the next TTC uh, meeting, um, cybersecurity is a cornerstone of our digital uh, agenda. Um, and that have to be addressed in many different aspects. And they were mentioned some of them. Uh, we see how digital technologies shape not only our economies, but just looking how they shape our economies. Uh, we also have to put high on the agenda, the initiative on sustainable trade. That set means how to fight together the uh, climate change, how to ensure or accelerate or to promote green digital transformation. Um, so there is a huge complex of issues also when it comes to um, economies and uh, sustainable trade. But not only economies, increasingly the digital technologies impact, as we said before, on our foreign security and uh, defense policies. So this is something where we see that new digital technologies are becoming a driver of our digital advances, but on the other hand, um, an engine of geopolitical competition. And together we should really have a good look into that. Um, we have, um, to conclude on EU and US, we have uh, considerable assets we can uh, bring to bear in shaping a responsible, democratic and secure global digital future. Um, and certainly we have to discuss more um, how to um, how to regulate um, in this context, how we can be capable to respond as Europe, as we always see that technology is ahead of us um, and uh, regulation is extremely complex, um, especially when you have big platforms, big tech companies that um, the only tool you have is to make a moral pressure on the companies because um, the capital gains go in line with um, you know their agenda. So the regulation or the global regulation in this context is extremely big challenge for all of us and also for Europe to be more self-dependent in this context. I have one last wish and thank you so much for bearing, uh, bearing with me and, and, and um, discussing these uh, such important issues. Uh, and that is to maybe address the um, regional perspective, if there is one to address. 
um, because we're sitting here, I mean, I currently sit in the middle kind of in Prague, but Estonia and Slovenia geographically, um, each at one end of a region that's now being termed as Central Eastern Europe. And uh, we have the Three Seas Initiative, which uh, had kind of its peak, but I, I'm not sure whether we are sustaining uh, sustaining it, the momentum as we should be. Um, and there's a, a lot of talk about uh, CE being the region of digital challengers and, and its great potential that digitalization could have for our economies. If um, I could ask Madam President and then um, Minister, Your Excellency, also to reflect on this, just your brief thoughts um, in conclusion of how do you see the regional dimension? Yes, Free Seas Initiative, indeed, maybe the uh, kind of high point of, uh, of uh, well, presidential involvement or government level involvement was uh, up to Tallinn, uh, Tallinn Summit. In Tallinn Summit, uh, basically, the uh, Free Seas Fund uh, also was created and, and is, is hence taking over this kind of uh, the initiative development from uh, from political actors and and I don't mind it. I think it's a good thing. I see that the initiative has made these hundred million people who live in this region to realize that they indeed are a market as itself, a region which can be promoted as itself and which can actually trade and develop among ourselves. Otherwise, we've been quite a lot, I mean, linking up to north and west and selling everything there and not seeing the, the opportunities among ourselves. Now, this has shifted and changed. I'm, I, this is quite clear. But this is infrastructure initiative and infrastructure nowadays, whether it's roads, whether it's railways, whether it's just digital, it always has this connectivity element. So we need to pay great attention also to cybersecurity within this initiative. But I do think this initiative indeed has a role to play in, in the future regional development. Can I? Yes, um, absolutely. I agree because uh, each regional initiative that brings together countries in the region with um, common challenges and finding uh, common solutions is um, very important. We have a lot of um, regional initiatives in our um, region here around, but discussing it coming back to our agenda on cybersecurity or digital technology, just look it to our direct neighborhood, the Western Balkans. We have uh, several cyber attacks um, recently, and we are establishing together, and this is a wonderful initiative, France and Slovenia Cyber Center in Montenegro, how, and there is already personal and working on it, how to fight um, cyber attacks and incidents. We see also a strong propaganda now with a new fake websites and uh, media reports and new media outlets that are paid by, um, be it um, 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 Russian or, or sources that are trying to, you know, to, to manipulate the, the origins or the results of the aggression in Ukraine. And all this is something that we have to bear in mind that the digital technologies on one hand offer great opportunities, but are causing a huge risk with cyber attacks and uh, um, also, you know, directing the mindset of societies. So that is why um, we, with regional initiatives, have to address that topic as I would even say as a priority. Thank you very much. Um, we have come to the end of the first part of the discussion. I would really, really like to thank both of you for taking the time, for being so honest and, and forthright with sharing your views. And, and thank you not just for participating in this discussion, but also as leaders, as women leaders in Europe at this very difficult and challenging times um, and for taking the baton and, and hopefully all working towards the same goal together uh, of making sure that the free world remains free, that we're more secure and connected together. So thank you again. Um, we will continue our discussion um, more on the topic of the publication, uh, which we're launching today. And I hope to see you soon in the future. Thank you. Um, now turning, thank you. Turning to our uh, panelists um, to continue the discussion with Evelina and Gregor. Um, as announced earlier, thank you so much for joining us, both of you. And actually, I was going to uh, start with the values question, but I will, I will kind of table it for just a second and come to you, Gregor, because we were talking with uh, Madam President and Madam Minister about regulation. And I know you're, you're head in deeply dive, uh, you're doing a deep dive into AI regulation and what 
EU is doing in the area of AI and how that should be reflected globally because it reflects our common values um, that we have. And um, one of the things that you mentioned um, in the publication or rather the message that came very strongly in your article for me was don't punish the technology, but regulate the human. Uh, so, and this is something that um, was also mentioned in this discussion, how we're basically confusing the cryptocurrencies with the technology of blockchain uh, behind it. But to, to bring that back to the AI, how do we come uh, to regulation that will that will set that will have that ability to set the global standard? You know, what's the right balance between regulating and not regulating, particularly when it comes to AI, which really is the technology that is groundbreaking. Gregor, we cannot hear you, I'm sorry. Are we having technical issue? <laughs> All right, well. Sorry, it's still not uh, working. So maybe we'll just, you have the question, keep it in your mind and I will come back to you as we solve this. Um, Evelina, if I may turn to you, I was, uh, I had you, um, you see the faith as fate has it, a lady has to go first. <laughs> um, I just wanted to um, talk to you about values because we have very strongly heard from both uh, panelists earlier uh, that we jointly hold these values. And I also outlined it and we're talking about it in the publication, um, democracy, human rights, rule of law, and our societies are based on these common standards and the legislation derives from it. But nevertheless, we have divergent views uh, in the ways we apply these values in cyberspace. And what do you think are the differences? You strongly pointed out this out in, your, in the article. Yes, first of all, can you hear me well? Yes. We can. Great, that's great. Uh, okay, so first of all, thank you so much for holding this event. Uh, it's been a great pleasure to hear what uh, Madam Minister and Madam President had to say about those issues. Uh, first of all, about the values part. Um, we, of course, we see some discrepancies between how the EU and the US as partners uh, somehow cannot see eye to eye on some issues, to put it nicely. Um, however, we are the so-called like-minded partners. And I would like to underline that being like-minded like does not mean thinking the same on every single issue. We have to think similarly. So uh, we are bound to have some differences and perhaps values uh, could be the very thing that connects us to makes us really think, uh, really see eye to eye on certain issues. Uh, for example, uh, in, in our part of the, of, the poly, of the publication, we underlined a few values like that, that Think, uh, are not necessarily yet the main connector of the transatlantic uh, cooperation, but we think that they should be, for example, privacy as one of the key issues, one of the key values, and we believe standards in cybersecurity because privacy is something that includes so many other different, like smaller values, perhaps not smaller, but uh, kind of sub values like moral autonomy or human rights, etc. It connects so many different things that really bring out the essence of humanity and the essence of using technology uh, to our own well being. So the technology works for us, not works against us. And I think that should be one of the things that really connects the transatlantic alliance and the transatlantic cooperation on technology. Um, because we do have some differences, mostly about the regulation, for example, like we all know what, what's happening with uh, AI regulation, I'm going to leave that to Gregor, but also to data regulation, for example, how we regulate data flows. It's been an ongoing debate for years and years, and it's, it doesn't seem to end, uh, as we know, uh, but values. Once we figure out what kind of values we really want to cherish in the cybersecurity world, in the cyber or digital world as a whole, uh, then I think we will be able to get those regulations really done. So it works for us. So it's universal to the transatlantic space. Uh, and so it doesn't have to kill innovation because this is also one of the uh, kind of arguments that we hear pretty often that regulation kills innovation. But it's, in my opinion, it's false. I think bad regulation kills innovation and good innovation, smart, innov smart regulation, sorry, 
uh, can really support innovation in a way that it includes, that it's built on some ethical values that we should cherish. Thank you so much. And actually, I will take that and put it to Gregor now because you also um, yeah, you also put it very succinctly. So uh, not all regulation is bad. Gregor, what's the what's your opinion? Don't punish the technology, regulate the human. <laughs> Where do we stand on this? Can you hear me now? Yes, sir, we can. OK, we were just one small step from me punishing my own technology <laughs> and going away from your statement. But it's before the digital uh, era, era, this would be a million dollar questions question. Now it's a billion dollar question. We have changed the stakes also because of the technology. And um, it's evident that technology is impacting our lives, similarly as in the past history of the human uh, civilization. I mean, we are changing the way how we live, how we are conducting business, how we value not only items, but only also our lives, our interactions, and also our political systems. Um, technology has become a challenge also uh, for democracy and rule of law and also human rights. And it is these issues that are most prominent in what I'm dealing with and also what the uh, Council of Europe is dealing with and also partly what the European Union is dealing with. But we're coming from different perspectives. European Union is looking at how to regulate the market. And the Council of Europe is looking at how to, in, how to um, set positive and negative obligations on member states. What are the rights and obligations of states in regard to promoting and ensuring human rights to the population? And it has been shown over the past decade that technology itself uh, can be deemed neutral, although it is not if it is used for malicious purposes or if it is unwittingly used in risky areas where it can negatively impact humans or even societies without proper impact prior impact assessment. And we need to address these issues. Otherwise, we will also jeopardize our democracy, our rule of law, and move toward a slightly authoritarian regime also in our areas. Can I ask you a question that is, um, how do I say, not very uh, deeply formulated? But you will understand how did GDPR become such a hit? Just look at it. How did the EU put together a regulation that was meant to be for our own internal purposes, yet it became a global hit? And now we have the, the possibility, uh, uh, our outside partners have the possibility and are feeling obliged in order to be able to do business with the EU uh, to replicate that or to join towards it, not necessarily replicate it. But how do we replicate those type of standards or that process? in the AI? And is that something that we want to be doing? Are we actively taking steps out? Gregor, I'll leave it to you. And then Evelina, you can reply to that. Well, GDPR can be considered a hit in terms of its global recognition and also uh, the impact it had on the businesses. But I would be restrained as to whether it has reached all its potential yet. Mm. Uh, but from a formal perspective, it has become uh, successful because we call it uh, a grandchild of the Convention 108 on the automated data processing, which was already um, developed at the Council of Europe in 1981, and which has addressed the challenges which we have with personal data processing and computer systems since the 70s, basically. And we know that um, European Union instruments are binding to its European Union member states. And Council of Europe instruments, treaties, conventions, can also be acceded by non-member states. 
and the combination of both instruments allows also global proliferation of the standards which were further developed by the GDPR. And in many other areas, we see a similar approach, for example, in cybercrime or um, biotech, also other issues uh, related to newer technologies. And we will see, I suppose, a similar approach also with the artificial intelligence. And this is, I suppose, the way to go. Mm -hmm. European Union can set very detailed operationalized standards for its member states and Europe as a whole can produce instruments which allow accession to these instruments or at least to the standards that are set by these instruments also globally by other members, by other global players. And we are seeing this in the AI, where United States, Canada, Mexico, Japan, Israel have joined the negotiations for the AI Treaty at the Council of Europe. And the European Union is playing a very important role in negotiating this instrument on behalf of the member states. So I suppose this approach will be in a way copying what you've mentioned with the GDPR, but from the substantive uh, perspective, the challenge with AI is much broader. It's much deeper. Uh, GDPR at the end, it's limited to um, data protection and AI applies to a very, very broad range of issues. And we can come back to these later. Mm -hmm. um, Evelina, your view. Yes, so my view on the GDPR, why it was such a hit, I would say it's also because uh, like with many other directives or acts of law that the EU is putting out, it's all about regulating the EU society, EU market, EU economy, etc. So if a partner of ours, for example, South Korea, which is also having its own version of the GDPR, uh, partners like the US as well, uh, they all have to get familiar with those, uh, with those acts, with those directives, and kind of fit their own functioning so they can still function on the European market. We see that happening with, with for example, the DSA and the DMA, which are quite straight on, head on, uh, dedicated sort of to European com uh, American companies who are operating on the European market as well. Uh, I, I can definitely see that happening also with the NIS2 directive, which is also going to apply to European uh, American companies, sorry, um, such as Google or Microsoft, etc. They all have to oblige to some rules, some standards that are going to be put in those directives. Uh, otherwise, they're facing some serious fines, serious punishments. Uh, and yeah, they have to come to terms with it that the EU as you know, the owner of the market has the right to regulate it. And as a way to regulate it, we do so through, for example, directives, which perhaps maybe they are more about like cybersecurity or social media platforms, etc. But they all, it all boils down to one thing that is safety of the market, the stability of the market and safety of the citizens of people using anything that is put out on that market, whether it's products, services, etc. Uh, it's those directives are here to protect us, to ensure that companies who are kind of setting themselves into our market uh, and delivering their services, their products to us, to our homes, our works, our schools, etc., uh, that those solutions are safe, that they are secure, that they are trustworthy. And that's also about, uh, like it was mentioned in the, in the previous conversation uh, with Madam Minister and uh, Madam President, trusted connectivity is also all about that because connectivity, it all has to be trust across the entire chain from the very ideas of solutions up until employing them and using them by citizens, for example, by governments, by companies, etc. Trust has to be employed and built in into every single element of that chain. And I think that directives, if uh, if done 
properly, adequately to the situation, can ensure that all standards are in place to uh, ensure the trust and ensure the safety. But if I can push you on this issue, and, and, and this is something that I think opens um, um, a whole other set of uh, issues around trust, is the fact that on one hand, we seem to have, we seem to have um, uh, the ability and are very effective in regulating in the EU. And that in essence also is an establisher of trust, that we can use this technology, that we feel safe, that we have standards for it. Uh, but on the other hand, that seems to be one of the factors that's precluding us from um, creating a deeper transatlantic partnership because of our diverging views. So how do we resolve that? Is there really a, a I'm not going to say a conflict, that's a strong word, but um, is there a divergence here or what, how do you look at it, Evelina? Are we, are we going in the right direction or should we um, compromise in some areas in order to create this very strong partnership, which is a basis to protect our values against the outside, uh, the others um, that just blatantly do not believe in those. They do not want to play the, the game by those rules at all. Yes, I mean, there, we are bound to have some differences, of course. Uh, however, I see that, for example, we can, we can do this both, both ways, I think. Uh, for example, when it comes to issues such as data security, uh, I and, and data flows that should be a separate matter that should be discussed in a like a separate kind of flow of regulation like the EU puts out something the US puts out something and then we have the civil society as well react to that because that's also uh, one of the key elements in that sort of puzzle data puzzle so to speak uh, however I would love to see the TTC do something about it uh, like I think it was me, Madam, me, Madam President uh, who said that she would love to see a common legal space for the transatlantic, uh, transatlantic sphere. I'm not sure if we can achieve a common legal space in a very broad manner. I think we should definitely seek some more similarities, more cooperation in some of the key areas such as data, AI, chips, for example, semiconductors as well, uh, as those are issues that are going, that are truly defining what our democracies are. Um, because in each of those areas, you can see that values should be the very fundament uh, of data, of AI, of semiconductors as well, because everything that is building those, uh, those technology chains has to be trustworthy and based on values. Um, and those issues as all, are also one of the few that really separate us from the authoritarian regimes that are using those technologies, those uh, those things such as data policies, etc., to uh, support authoritarian ways of ruling people or or abusing rights, etc. And I think that should be really the thing that really differentiates us, and at the end of the day, connects us, uh, holding up sort of like, like a united front against authoritarian regimes. Yeah, thank you, Evelina and Gregor. I want to hear your views on this uh, uh, on this topic as well, with regards to common legal space for transatlantic. We're probably very far away from that, but uh, where do you think we are with the transatlantic partnership? Well, the previous speakers, the minister and the president, and also Evelina have comprehensively addressed a number of issues that have to be taken into account. I'm limiting myself to a narrower uh, scope of AI. Uh, but uh, even there, we can see that um, there are differences in political, economic, and social factors in the transatlantic partnership. And they are affecting um, not only our cooperation, but also decision making process within individual countries. We see that we don't have a uniform view on these issues also in the United States. And in Europe, we often look at uh, ourselves from a national perspective and not from a European perspective. And European perspective is a crucial one. We are almost a 500 million population. At the Council of Europe, until last year, it was 830 million people or 840 million. And uh, with um, Russia out of the picture, it's still 700 million. And this is a sizable economic force. 
But more importantly, it is also an area which has a shared history and shared experiences which have led us to some values which might diverge or fork in uh, some ways, but are still much more closer than the rest of the world. And um, when we are speaking about uh, AI, for example, the political and uh, social values will come into play where we are when we are cat categorizing different types of application which require deeper regulation, so-called prohibited areas or high-risk areas. And I think that we are seeing um, an increasingly common understanding on both sides of the Atlantic. The differences, though, are in the tradition how we are addressing these issues. Are we leaving it up to the market or are we doing it in a centralized manner through uh, government regulation? And approach of the United States and Canada in trying to be part of the negotiations is a positive sign, but it can also, due to the um, legacy or bad dependency of the political system, lead into stalling of ne negotiations. Uh, but I hope that this newly found focus on what is really important will enable us to define what kind of a world we actually want mm -hmm. and create these rules on the basis of that. And as my previous speakers have already pointed out, we have already identified a number of issues that need to be addressed. We are not in some sort of uh, chaotic, unfocused uh, manner trying to address these issues, but we know what are the areas which require um, addressing. And then we are already um, addressing them through very in-depth analysis of what are the potential instruments that can uh, deal with this. So we are not um, haphazardly uh, trying to regulate something that would uh, not take into account the positions of the industry. For example, we already have a very inclusive approach both at the EU level and the Council of Europe level, and also, of course, on the transatlantic level. And I think we can find solutions which are not bureaucratic, but very pragmatic. But of course, it is up to uh, negotiators. And this also means negotiators from European national states to be aware of the power that they have and the responsibility that they have. And as for Europe, we need to um, hold, hold uh, strongly to our own values. Because, as I said, even in the United States, the situation is not um, one-sided. We are all faced with the challenges of the new technology that can turn also democratic societies into authoritarian if we do not look at technology from the perspective that it can be used to centralize power, actually create a new feudalistic system. Yeah, it has a, a massive amount of power, the AI technology and the way it can be applied. Um, and just as a concluding thought, because sadly we're coming to the end, I know we could keep going for, for another hour, uh, but just uh, Gregor, uh, and then I will pass it to Evelina as well. Um, very quickly, as, as in two or three sentences, what kind of AI do we want? If you were to project in the future, and if you're um, now talking to our participants here to, to have one last thought to keep in their minds, what would you tell? What would you tell them? What kind of AI do we want? First of all, I would want transparency in implementation of AI, and transparency in the design, development, and application of AI 
and this is a requirement for the humans, for the policymakers and the developers, so that we don't wake up one day in a world that we realize, oh, for the past 10 years, we have been led toward a certain direction by algorithms, and we have ended up somewhere we don't want. Thank you. Evelina, you said in the article, we need to figure out what core values should underpin our shared approach towards technology. Um, we do share core values. What's the main message uh, that you would like uh, people to take away from the discussion today, be it on values or transatlantic cooperation? One word, cooperation. Honestly, it's going to be as simple as that. We need to find the commonly shared values. They're out there because there's plenty of research, plenty of people have been talking about this for years to the point where uh, there are some people that believe that we shouldn't even talk about values anymore because it's been such a, you know, longly discussed uh, thing that, you know, it's it's all obvious, but it, it clearly isn't. We do have some differences. Uh, I think cooperation would be uh, the main part, uh, the main thing that I would like to uh, say to everyone who has been attending this uh, this meeting. And I think this is also one of the one of the messages that we have for the upcoming months. Uh, we see the power of cooperation, the power of working together. Uh, we see how that's helping Ukraine as our partner, as our ally. And yeah, this is this is my message: cooperation. Just cooperate, cooperate, and cooperate. Never stop. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, so exactly. Ended on this positive note uh, of this being the beginning, um, the middle, and 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 a future for our cooperation. So. Um, thank you both of you for uh, for your insightful thoughts, um, very valuable perspectives uh, that we've heard today in one hour. I think we've packed in a lot of issues and we could probably keep going and we will. I think we will organize follow up uh, events to this so that we continue this discussion so that we continue our cooperation. Um, with that, I would invite everybody to look at the uh, publication and read uh, Gregor and Evelina's articles uh, and others as well. And um, uh, thank you all of you for participating today. Uh, and I hope to, uh, to, I wish you a good day. And thank you both of you, Evelina and Gregor again. Thank you, it was a pleasure. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you, bye everyone. Bye.